Ladies and gents, we've got one of the nicest guys in angling that I know, Russell Shipton. Russ, how are you doing? You okay? Yeah, doing all right, thanks. Yeah. What's the crack down there? Fun? Are you just staying in down there or are you g g going uh, out? Yeah. Or... Yeah, we don't, I'm not going out at all, apart from shopping. Really? Uh, the numbers are pretty bad around this way. I'm, I'm from down in Kent and I just don't want it. So no. We're staying in, trying to protect us and everybody else because we don't want to give it to anyone either. Perfect. Right. So I know obviously you can probably go to a local venue. Angling Trust sorted that out for us. But I think there's a real grey area over local. What's local? What isn't? So unless you've got somewhere that's close to you and you know that's you know, fishing really well, at the end of the day, it's January, isn't it? We've got snow on the ground. It's been frozen. You know, it's probably just give it a rest for a few weeks anyway, I guess. I, I, I'm not rushing to go out. I, yes, I miss not going, but I'd rather be well. Yeah, and of course. This is a long-term effect as well, so, I'm, so we're being told. So if you can avoid it, you know, there's a long time for fishing in the future. Isn't there? Yeah, there is, there is. And I know, obviously, you like your warmer climates and it's probably not the yeah. right time of year, is it? So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first of all, okay. I, I want to talk about how you started your fishing how you got into fishing was it the classic sort of going with your dad or some mates what what sort of thing was it my earliest memory of fishing is when well, i think about four or five when i was with my dad my dad right. took me my dad was really heavy influence on me for all sports because basically you, you look up to your dad and he did everything sporting so i just did it, everything as well you know, he took me fishing when i was a lad um his mum and dad my nan and granddad they were heavily into fishing but sea angling and they both fished for england um a long time ago but my dad couldn't go on boats we couldn't travel on the boats he was ill right and so he taught himself to fish in rivers and course fishing you know way before poles came out and he was pretty good he did win a lot of things started a club and I just used to go with him and win as a club. Um, crikey. Things were a lot different then. Yeah. We used to go in a coach. Okay. Yeah, it was good. What? So you're Old talking family. about natural venues and you're, you're almost, you're obviously fishing, pleasure fishing to start with. And then did you start fishing matches then on when you went, when you'd go on the coach or did you just sit behind your dad or sit behind a few of the old? Well, what it used to be was, it was, well, it was really worked out well, but it'd be too expensive to do it now. But you used to, the, we used to have a hire coach every Sunday and it had a route and it went round this route and you had to walk to your nearest pickup on the route okay. with all your gear. Because obviously kit was limited, wasn't it then? Well, yeah. Not much kit now. We didn't take anywhere near as much and we got it all on the back of the coach and you took your rods inside and stuffed them on the back seats. But if the venue was anywhere near the coast, the mums used to come as well. So the coach would stop at the venue, all the fishermen would get off, and all the mums would stay on the coach with the small kids and carry on down to the beach. Right. When the match was fit, or when there was, it was the right time, everyone would get back on the coach, go back to the venue, you'd all go running down to your court work and pick them all up and then go home again. So it was a day out, so you didn't leave the missus at home. Right. So it, was, it was a good idea. A proper day out. So what are we talking? Without giving away your age, how long ago are we talking? What are we talking? Oh, that would have been in the 70s. Mid-70s, yeah. yeah. Mid-70s. I think I just got the tail end of sort of like coach-style fishing. Um, we used to catch the coach. We only did it a couple of times, but there was a coach that would leave. And that, I'd say that was sort of like maybe 1990, something like that. But after that, I guess it's... Well, it had all gone, hadn't it? Even nationals, they scrapped the coach system, didn't they? Well, yeah, I had a bad, bad time there once on the Trent, on the nationals. On, you had to get on a double-decker bus. Imagine getting all your kit on there. Right. And, uh, and one broke down, and you couldn't get across the bridge. So everybody had to go a completely different way, and we only got there like a few minutes before they all in. So, <laughs> <laughs> so how successful were you in those early years? Was it like... You were just well, frying your artist or? Yeah, I mean, my brother used to go with me, my dad and my brother, and my sister in the early days. Right. And so my dad used to drag us all down, draw the peg, and then we'd all sit next to him in the next little bit. Um, 
but I was only fishing against all the juniors, which was my brother and my sister and a few others. Um, it was, we just had a bit of fun, really. It wasn't, it was a competition, of course, and I wanted to beat my brother. Yeah. But in reality, it was more luck than judgment. If I caught one, was it bigger than his one? It wasn't right. anything like today. And I wasn't anywhere near, I didn't have the understanding of what I was doing. And my dad helped, but he was trying to catch his own fish and win his own championship. Mm -hmm. What do you remember of the fishing? Was it like hard fishing? Is, was it, or was it I good remember, fishing? Well, I remember we used to enjoy it. Right. But we never caught anywhere near the weights that we catch now. No. Cool. There was no commercial fisheries. It's, it was be a river or a lake, but mainly canals. We used to go to the Royal Military Canal at Hyde and along that way right down the coast, or on the marshes at Dimchurch, or somewhere along Apple Doorway. Um, but yeah, you had to, there wasn't a way in like we do now. The scales never came, you had to carry your fish to the scales. Right. So you had a water bucket, you used to call them, they were green canvas type bucket, which you, you put uh, your ground bait and stuff was in when you went to the peg. When you came back, you had to fill that up with water, tip your fish in and then carry it to the scales, which would always be on the first peg. Right, so if you've drawn peg 50, yeah. you've got so a long old walk, haven't you? You've got a long old walk, and if you'd had a good day, not only are you carrying the fish, you're carrying the water as well. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people talk about the glory days, don't they? But I think, I, I bet there was a load of fish around. We just didn't know how to catch them. Probably. I mean, there has always be a few bream caught in areas in certain venues you go to and some people would have really good days and other people would catch next to nothing but nowhere near the weights you know the weights now you know it's all if they're commercial weights the fish are put in there for you to catch aren't they yeah if you go to mr Biff, the, the store and canterbury area and stuff like that great river but if it'd been flooded the week before cool. you're pushing through different you know you just luck of the draw when you turned up yeah so how old uh sort of what age were you when you were like right i love match fishing i'm going to do some match fishing or have you have you been like a, a pleasure angler and you've dabbled in a few matches or how did it work i think uh, i always fished with dad like i said and we went um i left school at 16 i left home and i went straight away to work and I moved across to North London. And it was like, um, I, I joined the police. I joined the police cadets first. So at 16, I've left home. There's, I didn't do any fishing. Because it's like going to like a boarding school. Yeah. You're there all week, there's, you're living in a dormitory. There's two years of this. It's all sport, 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 fitness, super fitness. Right. So there's two years I didn't do any fishing. Yeah. Played a lot of sports, but not fishing. Um, when I came home at the weekends, occasionally I'd go with my dad, but not, you know, no competition wise. Um, then when I, as soon as I left that, I joined the police for real. Yeah. And you get posted, do all your training, you get posted. And when you get to where you're going, I, I concentrated on my job because I needed to keep my job. So you got to, you have yeah. targets, you have, um, People are watching you, make sure you can do different things, deal with an accident, know how to do it, deal with this, that, and the other. So I fishing, I, I didn't get involved with because I wanted to keep my job and get myself set. So I had a bit of a time off. I'd go occasionally for, with some friends to have a bit of fun, but I wouldn't fish any competitions. I just couldn't afford the time in case, uh, you know, if the job went wrong. But I guess after probably, eight to ten years of it then i ran, i worked out that the police itself had a really good angling club and there was places we could go police <laughs> the police did in them days if you represented them they gave you time off to go and do it perfect and that became a way that we could then go and i didn't have to miss out you know i was still at work but then they'd let you have a bit of time off to go and it it helped a lot, you know, yeah. because obviously shift work, I wasn't at home a lot anyway, or when I was at home, I was sleeping. So I didn't see my children and stuff like that. Um, then I got back into the match fishing because the, right. 
Netflix. So obviously, the competitive urge to beat your mates. Oh in well, the was were there sort of interforce matches and things like that? Yeah. Well, we still do that now. I mean, we have what we call interforce, but also it's called inter-service. Right. So you fish against the army, the navy, whoever yeah. provides a team. I mean, the army teams are usually really strong. Lots of them, they get a lot of time given to them. Fire brigade, post office, lots and lots. I fished one um, just before lockdown last year um, in Essex. That was, yeah, and they're big matches. They're, they're team matches. Yeah. Uh, it's down to teams of four now. I think there was, oh, that was restricted to 60 pegger. But we have what we call um, police inter service, but it's, it's police of the UK. So I, well, that's once a year. It's called the National Police Nationals. And people from, you know, PSNI from Northern Ireland come over and Scotland come down. And that is big matches. They are 180, 200 peg matches, and they're team matches. I'm and sure. they are once a year, each year, a different force puts them on. Right. In different, you know, um, we didn't have one last year. It was cancelled, obviously, lockdown. Uh, I think the future, the next one is proposed to be in Wales. Uh, the one before that was, was at Makings. Um, we've been to Ireland twice in the last four or five years. So, you know, it's quite varied. You basically, really, really strong competition. I know how serious they take it because I've we've, mm. we've um, coached a couple of times the army and the navy. So oh, yeah. they've got um, obviously a match coming up, and they're yeah. desperate to beat. So they get the whole team on the bank, and they get obviously a couple of good anglers down. And uh, Lee Kerr and myself, we've done it, we've been and coached them on venues for the day to um, obviously help them out for the match coming up. And yeah. they've they've got a budget there, and they've got like you say, there's a lot of emphasis on it because. It must be an awful, the things that you must see and how hard the work must be and the things that you must see, you must need that release. And obviously the people, the powers that be must see that because they encourage all that outside, um, well, outside sports and angling in particular, don't they? It, it always used to be quite high up within the service that that was what they thought, you know. Um, but then when you turn it around, things are different these days in all jobs. Yeah. And people are starting to question, why should you be allowed to go and do that when you're being paid to be a policeman? And I, I get that. I do understand what they're saying. It, um, it, it changed, and they don't get the time off at all now, not they used to. I mean, obviously, I'm not in the, the job now anymore. But they, it changed for the last period of time, and it's very, very hard for the people now to get, um, get a day off. Right. You know, when... Um, the last makings national. We, we usually go for a week. We have a week's holiday and we go and we practice and practice. Yeah. Because, like, there was, I think there was 18 different lakes in the competition. So you've got to, and for us down here, we've never even been to makings. Uh, we've got to get a feel for it because we want to win. Yeah, of course. Um, we have in the past paid people to come down. We have a lot of very good anglers. We, the, the Met was a, it's the biggest force. So you've got the amount of people you can choose from. Is more than some of the smaller forces, but um, we don't do that anymore. We don't pay people to go. We get no. we gather knowledge and then we go and practice, um, and we have fun. You know, it, it, it is a release, like you say, from some of the people that who are still working. It, it's it's not pleasant at times, and you do need some time away. But when you're with your mates, it's fun as well as competitive. That's how we try and do it anyway. Yeah. And I suppose you get a lot a week away with uh, it's character building as well. It's good good to get all together, isn't it? Talk to each other, yeah, see yeah. what everyone's about. It's, it's it's not just the fishing, is it? No, because we meet up once a year with all the other guys. I mean, I've got my mates in the PSNI. Imagine what they have to go through in their work. Yeah. And we have chats, we have drinks, and oh, <laughs> don't get into any drinking competition with anyone from over there because you're going <laughs> to lose. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and it is, it is a big social event. You know, get right. to see them once a year if you can, if they can get there. And the competition on the next day is really strong. You know, they always go for a week. Yeah. Unfortunately, we haven't done it for the last year or so. We might not even get this one in, but no. we'll be back to it. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Right, you, um, you sort of like 
got quite a big influence or you're involved with club fishing, aren't you? You're involved with the like, club. What club is it? And talk to me about how that's changed over the years. Because obviously years ago, clubs would have been massively influenced with match anglers, especially down south. But I think that's changing all the time, isn't it? It's, it's becoming well, different. Going back in time, like I said, my dad started a club and that was called Greenside. Greenside okay. Anglers. I think that's still going to this day. Now I can't think how many years that is, but it's it's got to be coming up to sixty, if not more. Right. Now um, I had a long, long time away from that, and now on a Wednesday I go out with the Wednesday Club down here, and a lot of them are from that old club, and they're still members, and it's still going. And I, I like, and, and that's why my club that I'm help out and I'm doing one of the matches is the, the Met Great Angling Club. We used to put out 130 people on a match. You know, you go to the Thames and you'd be draw last number and you have to do the walk off and you're calling out one, two, and you have to wait to 130. You know, it's a, oh. not a lot of swims left. But now it's such a struggle for people to um, get days off. So we're very limited. There's a lot of retired guys still go and well, even 15 is quite a good, really good number for us. So it, I'm trying to keep it going because it's great social for us, but it's a struggle. And I think right. that's the same with all these clubs because that the Greenside Club I mentioned, they're still going. They don't have any waters. They just have a match once every two weeks and that's their club. OK, what sort of venues are you having matches on? Well, with my club, because it's basically... In the whole of London, we have some in the south, some in north of London, some in Essex. Uh, well, we do always do one at Monk Lakes, that's in near Staplehurst, yeah. again. Uh, and not far from there's another one, um, Orchard Place Farm. Okay, that'll be two for the south. We go to Puddle Dock in Essex, just not far from the um, tunnel. Uh, we used to always do Coleman's Cottage, but that went to members only. But I believe that's coming back. Uh, there's one. A bit more north, uh, Willows. Right. Uh, basically, a circle around where the M25 is. And all, commercial, all our people travel in. All commercial fisheries? Normally, yes, nowadays, because we used to run it. It would be three canals, three rivers, three lakes. We might have been four of each, one each month. I think it was four of each. And then you'd have a river trophy, a, a canal trophy, and a lake trophy. Yeah. But we just don't have the venues anymore. You, you take your life in your hands if you fish some of the canals in places that yeah. we used to. The, the gear gets smashed by people riding along and they just ride off and you've got no chance. Um, so we've come away from the canal side. Um, rivers, we're still looking. We still try and do some on the Thames. But the last few times we've gone, it's been, if you book it up to go and the weather's not right, if it's, you know, the water's so dim, clear. can be hit and miss. Yeah. On. So basically, the way I try to run it now is the best day's fishing I can get for the guys that can make it. And okay. we won't even pick the venue until the week before. I'll ring around. I've got a big collection of people I know in there, all around the country, really, about what's it fishing like at whatever venue. And they say, oh, yeah, it's fishing really well there. So I'll put it up on our little chat sites because of social media now, we all keep together on WhatsApp group. And I'll tell them, oh, yeah, so-and-so is fishing well this week. Shall we go there? Because I'm booking it on a Tuesday, I can phone up last minute and get in yeah. nearly every. And I suppose, and you know what, run. that's probably the benefit of maybe not having 100 or 200 members because then you can yeah, be really yeah. agile and, and do that sort of thing. It, yeah, you can get nearly anywhere. Yeah. We have we've been talking about how we are getting a few more coming back now. But if we get bigger, we'll have to get bigger venues. Yeah, of course. And therefore you there's not so many of them to choose from. Mm. So yeah, but there are a lot of venues around to go to, so it's not too bad. You know, there's always a there's always somewhere we can go on a Tuesday because yeah, you know, nobody really has matches on Tuesdays. Right. Talk to me about your own personal fishing. So I want to know your favourite style of fishing. What's your fa like, favourite style of fishing? Because obviously I bet that's changed over the years. Yeah, of course. So, because mainly we all do commercials only really now. And I guess it's, it's F1 fishing. 
right? Because we've got we've got one or two really good F1 venues, which have I've seen them grow because I've seen the fish go from four to six ounces when they put in to now four or five pounds, right? And they've got harder and harder to catch. Okay, and it's a challenge, isn't it? That's what I like about. It. That's why I would guess F1 is the best. Yeah, I remember a time when down south there wasn't as many F1 ven- venues as no. well. But there's a few cropping up, isn't there? And I've, I think. I, I, obviously, a few years ago, even Gold Valley stocked a few F ones, didn't they? And they've, they really went to town on it. But that that's the right sort of fish to put into venues if you want people to catch in the winter. Yeah, of course. They seem to feed through the winter better than your carp, so they don't shut down and people stop going. Yeah, yeah. Seems good business sense to me. At least one lake, and Gold Valley have got their lake that's got all the F ones in there. I think it's called Middle Lake. Um, and they use it through the winter and, and you know, fill yeah. it up. Still get good catches. Right, so you love your F1 fishing. What sort of weights are you catching when you go on oh, your F1 venues? Um, well, what's your biggest place, weight? What's your, what's your biggest weight? At Orchard Place Farm, it, it is, well, it was, last time we, we could be going, uh, summertime, it was prolific, and I've had just short of 400 pounds in, in a match, oh, so five hours. <laughs> right. it's just it's silly i actually stopped going there in the summer because it got too silly. it was just it was you needed a rub it was just shallow match. fishing and but even in that you have times where you can't catch a thing they've moved right. they've gone they've gone up down left right whatever so you still have to do something but even through the winter there though that's why everyone around here likes it so much there you can catch really good weights of these f1s because they're big f1s it, it, you know, I've been there and broke the ice and had under pound. Really? And, and you can't beat that for a day's no, fishing on. That's amazing. And, but they don't hang themselves. You've got to have to work them out. Right. And they will move and they will change and you've got to keep in touch with them. But that's the skill of it. And that's why I like it. Right. So you go talk to me because obviously you're 400 pounds of F1s is a lot of fish. Talk to me about the gear you're using for that. So what sort of like float are you using to start with? And well, how, deep, how deep is it? How deep are you fishing from? Well, that day, when I'm talking through the summer, that's more just shallow fishing. Okay. You know, they're all up in the water within top two foot of the... Okay. Just got, it, isn't, it doesn't really matter on those sort of fishing for me. You can use a jigger, you can use a little... Um, anything, really. Right? Yeah. Mainly, though, like I say, I go in the winter, and, I lo- and that's when I like it the best. And I use the... Um, the midi rat one. So this is when you're catching like a hundred pound. You're scaling well, it down a little bit. You can catch 150 pound quite regularly in, wow. in the winter. Wow. So a lot um, of fish still. People say when we hear, you know, you post goes gets posted on your sites, and people say, oh, they should put some water in there because it's, mm. it's all full of fish. It isn't like that. You, it's probably we would weigh 20 fish for a keep net, so it's 60 fish. It is 50 pounds, 60 pounds for the limit. So 20, 40, 60 fish, three nets full up. Okay. Is 180 pounds. Okay. But that's 60 fish. So 60 yeah. bites. You take that down into five to six hour match, whatever you want to do. It's eight bites, maybe an hour. Yeah. People say it's rammed full of fish. Eight bites an hour is not. You've still right. got to get everything bang on, even when you're catching yeah. some weights. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the better people win. Yeah, you know, it's the way it is, and there are better areas, of course. But, but right, just that, just for that, everyone who wants a bit of kit, um, get their fishing kit fix, a rig then that well, you can take okay. this time of year okay. to a prolific F1 venue. Talk me through yeah. it. So start with the start. With, I tell you what, we'll start with the elastic first because I think that's quite important. So, what sort of elastics are you using when you're catching a hundred pound, hundred and fifty pound sort of thing? I would go there. I fish quite light myself. I fish the um, cerise coloured um, reactor core okay. midi elastic. Okay. It's uh, a quite light, but the idea for me is I just lift up, doesn't matter if it's eight ounces or it's five pounds, I lift up and I look down, my elastic straight down because yeah. I've just lifted. And if it goes to the left, then I just follow it to the left. Yeah. And I want it light and it's not spooking everything. So that's, then I can play it over here and, and okay. We're pulling it, it's pulling kits, and it takes a bit longer, but you want to get that fish out. Yeah, because we're talking, what are we talking? Three pound, three, obviously three pound fish, four pound fish. Yeah, and it can how, be how, easy. How, yeah. deep, how deep is it? 
six foot, something okay, like that. Okay, so it's a reasonable depth. It's not a little shallow place. So, yeah, okay. no, no. Yeah, nice. Um, main lines and hook lengths, what are we talking there? Um, I usually have O10 hook lengths. Okay. Um, I will have O12 made up, but usually I'll always start on the O10 yeah. and I get most of them in because there's plenty of carp in there as well now. They've, but you can still get them in in the winter, yeah. can't you? Uh, I'll use uh, 6313 hook because okay. usually I'm fishing start what, pellet. But what a cool hook that is. What a cool hook. Apparently, apparently people are struggling to get them at the minute. They've, they've yeah. sold. Everyone is struggling. I've seen on Facebook, anyone got any in stock? Anyone got any in stock? So no. I, think, I uh, think to me, they're so light gauge that it's really important that the slow fall, the last six, eight inches of it before it hits the yeah. deck when they're watching it. And I've used them ever since I've been able to get them. So what size are you using? 16, 18? I use 18 to start, but if it's if I'm not seeing it, I'll get go down to 20. Really? Okay, so yeah. even though you're catching a big weight, this is quite oh, yeah. finesse gear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, there were... At a time when I was learning at this F1, I, I used to go there and sit behind some of the best guys I knew and uh, just watching them. And you see, even the difference, I see him one day, he would feed one guy in particular, he fed six pellets, didn't get a bite. Six pellets, didn't get a bite. He said, he told me, I'm going to try 10. Put 10 pellets in, bite. Right. 10 pellets, bite. Yeah. It just showed me the difference, how small things can make. Mm. And that's what, the same thing with a small look and small That's lines. F1 fishing. If it's not working, try it. Yeah, it magnifies every little mistake F1 fishing does, doesn't it? And if I always mm -hmm. think if you're good at F1 fishing, you can use that knowledge for all styles of fishing because all those little tiny subtleties yeah, yeah. to your fishing make a massive difference. I tend to fish most venues the same now, like I'm fishing for F1s, even if there's yeah. just carp there. Yeah, of course. Not yeah. so much on the drop, but because... With it, again, going back to the rig you was talking about, I'd use the um, MWF1 carbon for the slow fall. They, okay. They've got that wrap. It's like a, a slim float, is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's quite a slim body, fairly long, well, maybe about an inch and, a, inch and a quarter, inch and a half length of body, but slim as anything. And it just sits and, and, and gradually straightens up. Uh, but it's got that wrap on the eye, so... It's not going to rip out. Yeah, and uh, you've, got, you've, you've actually got slow. you've actually got the best of both worlds there, haven't you? Because I hate having that spring eye around the tip. So just think for presentation, it's just not it's just not the one for getting a really good presentation. But then obviously you've got the downside of having a proper side eye that they can rip out. Obviously that someone whoever's made those floats taking the time to wrap that round and mm. secure that eye in, it just transforms the float. Transforms the float. You get the finesse. You know, the subtlety with that presentation yeah. with obviously some robustness there, don't you? When I first saw them, I didn't like the look of that round that wrap. I thought that's going to not be as have the finesse because it, it mm. does look a bit bulky. But when you set it up, all that's below the surface and it doesn't affect it at all. And it's very, very um, yeah. sensitive because you've got part of the stem coming through into the tip. And so you can dot it right down like do for the F1s and it just sits there right which is what you need isn't it? Yeah. any little touch on it and it's gone spot on now I want to talk to you as well just uh, sort of finish off because I want to talk to you about Spain because first time that I saw you on the bank you were running the bank for me un unknowingly <laughs> I was fishing a match in Spain and um, you turn up on the bank and you're totally telling me what everyone's caught around and walking along there what, what's, the, what's the river called the hookah. The hookah. It's J, isn't the it? The hookah. J U C A R. Yeah. Yeah. The hookah. So I'm fishing a match on the uh, Sky Iberian feeder match, and um, Russ obviously turns up. How are you doing, Rob? I've just been up there. He's got three fish. He's got two fish. I've just seen a guy catch some fish on uh, sweet corn, and the knowledge was like, you know, on the day, on a hard day. Obviously, you were my bank runner. It was brilliant. And then you started telling me that you're playing cricket over there, and I'm trying to put two and two together. <laughs> then obviously I've realised that you live over there as well, so you fish this river all the time. Talk to me about how that came about, and your Spanish star fishing. What's, what, what do they do in Spain? Well, uh, 
how it came about was um, my parent, my, my dad retired, and <laughs> my mum and dad had only ever been abroad once in their lives. On well, Jersey, they went on their honeymoon. They'd been married. They were married a long, long time. But when he retired, for some reason, they just upped and went to Spain. They got one of these holiday things where you can go and look at property, and they bought a plot and had a villa built and moved. And we was all the kids were grown up, so I used to go visit. Our holiday every year was to go there and see him and stay with him. Um, but my dad picked a plot where it was a, a bottom of a mountain, looked over this La Margelle. It's a nature a nature reserve place and full of rivers and dikes. Okay. We could literally walk out of his garden, there's a dike there. We would wander around, you'd see carp, but wild things, not, not. Okay. Uh, and um, I mean, you know how hard they fight when you catch a two pounder over there. Pull your arm off, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I used to fish with him all the time. We didn't have any decent gear. We just had whatever we could get hold of. But um, one day, I don't really know why, we were there on holiday, my wife and I, and I think we had my daughter, and we just decided that next door there was a villa that had been empty for at least 14 years. We'd never seen anyone in it, and I saw someone in it. So I knocked on the door and I said, is this your villa? Do you want to sell it? And he said, it's not mine. It's my friend's. He lives in Denmark. And he phoned him there and then, and he said, yeah, okay, I'll sell it. And a few emails. He sent me the keys. I took a career break from work. Now, from work, you was allowed to do that. That was lucky. You was allowed to do it for three different reasons. And one of them was look after relatives. Well, my mum wasn't very well. So I could use that to go and say, I wanted to, I need to look after my mum. But I also took my two children who were very young and gave my mum a chance to see them growing up a bit. Yeah, brilliant. Put them into school. Within a month, they were Spanish fluent. It was unbelievable. Um, that was it. We've... We went fishing to the fishing club there. Once I found out where they were, they were all, well, there were some good anglers, but it was different style to here. It was a lot of, they were inventing their own way of fishing. Some people would get a curler and put some ground bait around it because you couldn't buy anything. You couldn't buy feeders. There was no method feeders. Okay. Or, so how long ago would this have been then? I, I, went, there in, I went there in 2000. Yeah, so 20 years. 2000, they're, 2001. They're still, using, they're still using hair curlers in 20 years ago. They're still doing it now. Wow. Unbelievable. Because if you think back to when you went, you went to one fishing shop, one fishing mm. tackle shop in Solana. Yeah. Well, my dad lived uh, maybe 40 minutes down the roadway from where you was, and okay. there's another 20 minutes to get to Solana. Well, the rest of the, the fishing club came for another hour past them. So they never could even find a tackle shop. A few places like, they're called hunt, the hunting shops in Spain, they sell a bit of fishing gear, but it's normally sea stuff. So you just couldn't get it. Couldn't buy ground bait, yet to make your own. I remember when we talked about, you talked about what ground baits do you use there? Yeah. I couldn't help you because we never had any. No. We couldn't, we had to make our own. We got breadcrumb, but then we just tried to mix it. Well, that tackle shop in Solana is fantastic now. It's got loads of stuff in it. Yeah. Well, yeah, so you just can't imagine what it used to be no. like, maybe. Well, it, the fishing used to be a lot better. Did it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we would regularly, regularly on that venue where you've been have um, 100 kilos. Wow. Of fish. Had a pole. I've even caught them slapping and barbel, big barbel. But wow. not so we're struggling for sort of like two to ten fish a day now, which is it's hard. But when you do get one, obviously the tip toes round at a million miles an hour, and then you know you've got a battle on. They pull your yeah. honestly, they fight so hard. Brilliant fishing. When we first went there and I saw the people catching the fish, you know, two pound fish, pound and a half fish, whatever, I went out and I got my gear and I put it together and I think I had some like a four pound bottom or something and a, a normal sort of hook. Every fish straight in the hook or broke the line. Brilliant. For the first three <laughs> months I was there, I ended up with, I think we had something like eight pound Maxima straight through to a 12 hook. Wow. <laughs> and they still struggle. But yeah. yeah, good fishing, good fun. Fantastic. So are you, are you anything to do with a club over there? Do you, do you, are you a member of the club or yeah, do they I'm have still many a member. Yeah, uh, they go every week. 
I was stuck uh, there in the last lockdown because I went for a holiday. Oh, and couldn't what, get a back. what a shame! <laughs> I did go fishing. It was quite funny. Some of the things I did. A friend of mine still runs the club. It's called the Fisherman of the Torium. Right. Uh, he's been running it for thirty years over there, and it's there's e English expats. There's English that go on holiday to their holiday home, but come back and then go again and go back. There's there's some Dutch. There's some Belgians. People. Uh, it's a a lot of different people. All the reason they that they, um, they all join is because Mike sorts out all the licenses. When you went, you had a problem with fishing, didn't you? Because you, yeah. you went on the wrong day and <laughs> you can't fish there on Monday. <laughs> the police come along and they got guns. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. They've got guns. Yeah. <laughs> so Mike sorts it all out, and he does mine. I give him some money when I was last there. He buys a license, you need a federation license because that place, that part where you go, the better bits of federation waters. So you've got to have a federation license, you've got to have a normal fishing license from the Valencia region. Uh, and you've got to know where, where and when to go. And so if you yeah. join a club, it's not much, it doesn't cost much, but it's you try and buy them on your own. Yeah. And it's very difficult. Right. But Mike knows how to do it. Yeah. So do they have many competitions or is it just. Yeah, yeah. So I. I they fish every week. Yeah. Do you have you entered many? Have you done? Have you had a few? Yeah. I when I'm there, I fish with them every week. But I fish the Spanish nationals, which is oh. that's an event. You um, on that river, the hookah. I fished the first round. Uh, you you fish for three hours, then they blow a whistle. Match is over. You have to pack up, move swims, and go and fish somewhere else for another three hours, where somebody else has already been fishing. Right. <laughs> so if someone's bowled it in in your peg where you've gone, <laughs> yeah. you just don't know what's going to catch, what you're going to catch. They come along and you're not allowed to have any weight on the bottom if you're using a pole. Okay. And so they come along and clip, uh, uh, clip on weight to your lowest weight. And if your float doesn't sink, you're disqualified. <laughs> God. Yeah, it's, it's quite funny. They're, but they must have had something like a thousand people in that match all the way through that river, as far as you can tell. Uh, I qualified that year, and then the next one was about four hours drive up, up the motorway, but I think I only caught one fish in the first half, and I never, I blanked on the second half, and I never got through to the, the final round. Right. But it, it's interesting, and that's where you meet the proper Spanish anglers, because you don't meet them very often. You're only there on the competitions, the big ones. Right. Okay, so how easy do you think it is getting kit over and all that sort of thing? Is it is it easy to do or is it a pain? It is difficult. That is the worst part of it all. You have to drive it over there. Mm. You can't take, well, you can, but if you're just doing your look, feeder one, yeah, you can take them by the plane. and you We can wouldn't, take have been them a, pack we wouldn't be able to do it pole. We wouldn't be able to do the pole no. one. But no. I, I guess, what do I take? You, sort of like five feeder rods in a hot, in um oh yeah, actually, we actually get vans to take it over but on yeah, a plane yeah. i think you could wrap it all up in rod tubes and you could get sort of like five rods over a landing net pole yeah minimal it's gear. costly isn't it it's co mm. costly because you you'd have to take out extra some sort of sporting insurance and i mean i've been looking already and you can get flights i know this what's happening is changing it but you can get flights for 20 pounds to go there and 20 pound back yeah. but You've got to get your kit there, and that's the problem. I don't know what they're charging to try and take kit because we're only looking at the the cheaper end companies, you know, your, your budget lines. But uh, my stuff I've got out there now is yeah, some of the rings are gone, and some so I'm struggling with some of the kit. But to to actually, I've driven there many many times, but not in recent years because it's too expensive. Right. All the tolls, the fuel's double what it used to be. The tolls are double what it used to be. So, you know, my daughter just went during the lockdown before, and she did, like, working from home before, from in Spain. Okay. And um, it's cost her a £1,000 to get there and back. Right. So, you know, flights is the way to go, or flights. one big van with all your kit. Yeah. But if you've got these hard cases these days, you can pack your rods in there and... Pack your rods in and in, in your reels in, and you don't need a lot really for the feeder fishing side of it. Do you, so no, no, it's good. It's good. We really enjoy it when we go. It's like it, it sets up the year because it's we go in mm. sort of like early March, 
the weather's just picking up. Obviously, it's still miserable here. And it's sort of <laughs> like the start of our year's fishing. It's, it's brilliant. But obviously, it won't be happening this year, which is a shame. But we love it. We absolutely yeah. love it. You say the weather's picking up. Do you remember when it was that rainy day? Oh, no. We've had, we, listen, we've had a couple of days where it's been <laughs> really, really bad, like torrential <laughs> yeah. rain. Yeah. But, and that was English weather. They kept saying, you've bought the weather. The English have bought the weather. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tried to tell you the day before and, and all the others that yeah. it's going to rain tomorrow, but if you haven't seen it, this is rain you've never seen. Yeah. You don't want to be in. And uh, I saw Tommy's umbrella get blown in half and he didn't like it. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, not like him to uh, uh, Yeah, but yeah, it's normally good weather and it's normally fine. It's good fun. It, it's... The, the thing about there, like you were saying, it's great, but it's really tough fishing. Yeah. Like six bites a day. Mm. Okay. And, and, and then you've got a land. Something like that. But you can still win the section. Yeah, you can, yeah. Three yeah. or four <laughs> fish can win the section, but you've got to land yeah. the bite. You've got, to, you've got to get the bite in the first, but then you've got to land them because there's rocks everywhere and proper wild fishing. But I, obviously, I urge anyone who's not sampled that sort of thing just to try and give it a go just to try and spread your wings a little bit and just give it a go because it's, it's it is di it's different but you can still use the skill sets that you've got to learn yeah. in the uk to catch your fish well there's loads of people who help you isn't there yeah, there there is, yeah. The, the english people that go now is growing and growing you know, yeah. i don't know 25 or so last year maybe more i'm yeah. i'm not sure but the big part of it we haven't really talked about is the social yeah. the after event isn't it you know in yeah, that is, yeah. And with the tape on your head, if you blank. <laughs> tape on your head, if you blank. And, and Friday practice, pack up halfway through, go and have your paella, we cook the paella for you. It's just, it's just a different way of life. It's more relaxed. It's just great. Mm. Well, um, Jamie takes his dad, and his dad gets taken off halfway through the day by a couple of women and gets paella fed yeah, to him. <laughs> yeah, he does. Fair play to him. Look, he deserves it. He's a nice bloke. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Russ, thank you very much for your time. Edit, edit out all the bad bits. <laughs> <laughs> There's no bad bits, mate. I'll see you later, mate. See ya. <laughs> I'm sure I'll speak to you. You take care.